worked on many projects that have been built at multiple parks at the same time, like Big Thunder and Splash Mountain. What kind of design challenges come up when working on projects for different parks at the same time? Well, hopefully they're not quite at the same time so that you have like, oops, and then you don't do that again <laughs> on the second one. Uh, but because we do a lot of homework and how we're going to build it, you know, um, generally there isn't that kind of a, a situation. It becomes a little bit problematic to be in two places at the same time. So you real quick find your new best friend who's going to do the other one and you just bond and become like two extensions of the same way of thinking and then we call each other saying I just got to this thing are you to that point yet and or I'll say I better warn you up front that you know coming down the pike is this thing to happen and Big Thunder and uh, it was uh, separated by a year Splash Mountain was about two and a half years and then the, you know, then the uh, subsequent ones were way beyond that so uh, you know it wasn't it wasn't really that much of a problem. Mm -hmm. I think if you are bringing um, up something that was like Star Wars we did solely at Disneyland until we worked out all the bugs because um, it had never been done before like you know the biggest challenge was getting people on board and off in a very short time I think it's down to like five minutes or a little over that um, so that you could get 20 shows or no, what is that five? Tw 12 shows an hour close to that in order to make it practical. Otherwise, you'd need to have 40 of these devices if you could only do it two times an hour. So um, a lot of that goes into the, the first article. And then, um, okay, so now we've got the film for Star Wars. We've got, we know how to program it, and we've figured out how to get people on board and on board. So the, it becomes something very easy to do the second one and the third one. And why not? It's not quite the same challenge is um, doing them if we had done those all at the same time and uncovered the same I mean like you know in that one we have to very be very careful to cool down the hydraulic fluid that powers the machinery and that's not normally done because in a real airline simulation you're trying to keep the plane perfectly level and so how often you exercise it is not very much um, and then the star tours thing is to make it as aggressive as possible and so you're really challenging the energy on that oil all the time. So we had to develop systems to, to cool it. You, know. you talked about repurposing and saving the animatronics from America's Sims yeah. and putting them in uh, Splash Mountain. Are there other repurposed animatronics or other, other things that you've seen around property over the years that you take pride in having, having done that with? Yeah, we did. Um, in Pirates in California, I don't know about what ended up here, a lot of the World of Motion characters ended up there. Less now than there were when we first did it, they took a few of them out when they brought the Johnny Depp overlay into it. So they removed a few, but I know all the conquistadors up on the uh, parapet are actually the cowboys and Indians from the Wild West scene in World of Motion. and. Uh, there's a couple more in the, um, the, the the pirates that are all drinking and everything, and the, the, there's a barrel with all the wine coming out. There's a couple of them in that area too. And related so. to that, the the splash characters that show up, the Song of the South characters mm -hmm. that show up in the Walt Disney World version or the uh, overseas versions of, of Splash, I guess it's Tokyo. Yeah. Uh, are those replications of the America Sings? Yes. Uh -huh. So uh, now the, the nice thing they had to do is we did some modification if a character wasn't appropriate. Um, we eliminated a few, but or we modified them like the girl, the bird in the gilded cage. We had to modify that and the guys on the bicycles that rode back and forth in the gay 90s section. Uh, we might have lost those completely. I can't remember, but I think the brilliant thing was I think it was Bruce Gordon who said, let's just put them all on a big showboat at the end of the ride. And, you know, that way everybody can be going, ah, oh, we survived. It's a wonderful thing. But he do, da, da. And so um, that was, uh, you know, a way to keep the majority of that cast together. But the thrill was finding that Mark Davis had done so much of the design for, for, uh, for Song of the South. You know, it was, it was great. It was, I felt like we were doing something that was right. And I, it had never been done before that on Broadway, a big selling point is that the cast from this new play is 
you know, Bette Midler and Hello Dolly. Okay, so that's a great thing. It's making it a stronger thing because you're getting to see a performer that you like. So we thought, you know, these are stars that have come out of a show that's been running for over 10 years. So they've got a new new performance to be in, you know. I'm just old enough to have seen America Sings. Uh -huh. My first in visit to Disneyland. You guys are making me feel really old. Because <laughs> I was like old when it opened, I think, you know, so 73. But, you know, 73 to 80, whatever, five or six. But the one nice thing, when we knew we were going to save them, we went down to Disneyland and said, don't let those deteriorate because you're going to be moving them over to their new home and they better be fantastic. So the last day I went on America Sings, it was perfect. There was nothing wrong with it, you know, so. Um, so in the Spark of Imagineering um, panel, you had talked about how timing is a factor. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that the timing wasn't working out and like Mike yeah. Davis reused a lot of his gags and stuff and other like would show up in other attractions so is there something where timing didn't work oh, out? Oh sure all the time. Is waiting to come back? Well they never go away like I, mm -hmm. I kind of alluded to Discovery Bay you know not happening that's because there was a, when we first designed it there was a movie that we were pending it on which was Island at the Top of the World mm -hmm. well we all thought it was going to be the new 20,000 Leagues and it wasn't and so the last thing anyone wanted to do was e even go further into something that hadn't scored very well with the public because, especially with management, I, I would be cavalier and say, well, what we're doing has no bearing on that. It's going to be good on its own right. But, you know, you're dealing with the stockholders and various other things. And if something hasn't scored, they kind of feel that it's maybe the genre of, of steampunk or whatever you want to call it that nobody is interested in but we did manage to bring a lot of that to life later but yeah it often happens that the timing just the timing of telling an yeah, echo story back in 90, 1982 mm -hmm. um, wasn't here yet and so it became a, a food story about you know renewable resources in the future and so forth and not you know not worrying about how do we feed a growing population because we can grow rice and in bogs and, and salt water and so forth and cabbages in outer space. So it was a very reassuring story, but it wasn't about the ecology of the land at that time, because the timing, now that would be a story you'd be a home run to put that in. So timing is, I remember we, you know, they, they knocked down Walt's Tomorrowland in 1966, just after he died, or be, right at the same time when he passed away to put in a new one. But about 20 years after that, the whole nostalgia craze for the unbridled, enthusiastic, innocent tomorrow was back in full vogue. And so we actually had to recreate the rocket <laughs> to the moon because it had this kind of retro fun. So timing is a bugaboo. You know, you're always either hoping it'll work in your favor, but you know, it can often, you know, backfire and not, not reward you with something you want to do. Speaking of timing, at what point in the creative process does road, um, ride capacity and load time um, <laughs> figure into everything? Um, it wouldn't be at the very beginning, but um, I think a good designer has sort of an intuition about that. And that, we, you know, if, you're, if you've done it enough times, you're not gonna embark on something that uh, is gonna ultimately fail because it doesn't, uh, doesn't work in either of those ways. There's ways around it, but they're not very efficient. Like I used to say, every dollar of the show in Pirates of the Caribbean is seen by every guest. Whereas you go to other forms where there's 40 different vehicles or something like that, then you only get to see 1 40th of the, of the show if you're seeing a, a custom design thing for you. And that's why I'm, I think I'm a big fan of immersive experiences like the Jungle Cruise and Pirates and Splash Mountain and whatnot, because all of our guests are getting to see an enormous thing that we can afford to put all the money in. If you go to, to VR systems, you end up bringing it down to a one-on-one, -on -one and then you've got this capacity issue of needing to have hundreds of those to get the, the right amount of people through, because you're talking 2,000 or more on a major must-see attraction. So that's a lot of uh, single-use things if you were going to go that route. So. That's my common sense, mm -hmm. and everyone has a different approach about that, but I, I think before I get out the gate, I've figured out all these 
things that might come up to hurt us. So if we're doing star tours, we're going to need between four and six of those vehicles in order to do it. Whereas if you're doing, um, you know, something like Splash, every vehicle is going through one show. So we only need one track and, and everybody sees everything, you know, so. Was there a particular attraction that, that you were working on where the capacity and or ro uh, load time became an issue and really was challenging mm. to make it all come together? Probably Star Tours was the most. Okay. Because at Disneyland, we were very tight on space. And it was easy to do four, which is far lower than here. I think there's five here and there's six at every other park. And so six is the ideal of what we'd like to have. Five is acceptable and four is under. And I remember we said, we can do the four easy. If you want six, we're going to have to take something down at Disneyland to get the space. And at the time Michael Eisner was there, he says, well, you know, it's been my observation that if you see a giant line for something, it makes you more intrigued to want to wait and find out why all those people are waiting in line. And I said, you know, you're kind of right. You know, if nobody's going on something, you don't want to do it. So sometimes that can bite you of like providing too much capacity and there's no one waiting there and the energy of, you know, I, I'm not an advocate for waiting in line two hours, but on the other hand, I think 20 minutes of waiting to see Star Tours is great because you see all the stuff in the queue and we capitalize that on Indy where it's a really neat queue and um, more the, 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 the new ride here, Frozen, mm -hmm. it's got a great queue where there's some interactive things in there and so I think it can be a, a plus because you're only on the ride for a few minutes and if the, the the show that leads you into that is captivating and immersive then it it tends to make people think of a bigger experience that they had than if you're I know I've rushed people in through there's a secret door on star tours <laughs> and they go right into the cab but they actually lose the sense of mm -hmm. what this story and this place and the conceit that you're at a bus terminal and outer, <laughs> going through outer space, that kind of goes away, you know, so I like.